Hey guys, what's up everybody? Welcome or welcome back again to another video from the Apex Academy of Mathematics. We are learning the language of the universe begins here and we are here um, attempting to do the January 2021 paper. I must say a pleasant good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to all my students right across the world, wherever you are. I do hope that you clicked on this video simply because you're looking for some help on this particular past paper or other past papers um, that you might be um, looking for. All right, so I do hope that um, we are gonna be able to make a connection. And uh, in this video, not only will I be going through the past paper giving you the answers but i'm also going to try to show you different variations in terms of how the questions can be worked as well as showing you the thought process what to think about what clues to look for and of course definitely um giving you the easiest route to getting to your answers all right now this paper i have perused through it and I've seen some questions that are a little bit um, different from how CSEC usually sets your questions. So get ready to um, get into that thinking part of your brain and let's get on with the show. All right. So here on the screen, as you can see, you already know the rules for the exam and so forth. It is two hours and 40 minutes long and that kind of stuff. You should be able to read that and you know the rules, yes? We're gonna go on to the next page here, which is going to be a signing up section here. All right, that's fine. And here's where we have your formula sheet, all right? This is your form, let's move it up a little bit here. All right, and there are some useful formulas that you can find right in this area here. So what is going to happen is that uh, depending on what the question is, I may just come back to this page to show you where you can find um, your reference formula. All right. So that's it. So let's get into the show. I've updated my screen here for you so you can have um, a much better view. All right. So let's get into it. Section one, answer all questions, all workings must be shown clearly. And there, uh, for those who are watching, um, we are doing the January 2021 recent paper. Okay, so let's get into it, guys. So the first uh, question here is, let me just get my pen out. All right. So the first question here is, fractions all right and it says using a calculator or otherwise calculate the value of one and four sevenths plus two and a third minus one and five over six all right and there are no brackets there there aren't any brackets anywhere so that doesn't mean um that means that we can just work it according to the PEMDAS principle okay and we know that the PEMDAS principle p-e-m d-e-s we must add before we subtract, all right? Because there's only two operations here, plus and minus. So we're gonna be adding. But before I go about doing the addition of the fractions, I wanna convert these mixed fractions here to improper. So I wanna pretty much just convert this one and four sevenths into an improper fraction. So that's going to give me, uh, let's see, seven one seven plus four, that's going to give me 11 or seven. All right, so I'm going to do that conversion right there. Then I want to convert this also, this 1 and 5 6. 6, 1, 6 plus 5. That 2 is 11, but this is over 6. Okay, so what I literally have now is 11 over 7 plus 2 over 3 minus... 11 over 6 that's what I have now the rules for addition and subtraction of fractions are the same we are simply going to find the LCM all right so rather than doing the first two then getting an answer 
then subtracting the last fraction from the result, we can just do everything at the same time. All right. So we're going to simply just find the LCM here and the LCM here. Let's work it out. So we're looking at um, what I usually do when I have numbers like these to find the LCM. I try to multiply the two largest numbers. Right. And then check to see if the third or the fourth number is able to go into it. So I'm thinking that six seven seven times six is 42 and if i check if three can is divisible into 42 then i realize that three is exactly divisible into 42 so i'm going to use 42 as my lcm All right now seven goes into 42 obviously it's going to go six times yes six times because seven sixes is 42 so 7 into 42 goes 6 times, 6 times 11 is going to be 66. Now 3 will go into 42 14 times. So that's 14 times 2, that's going to give us 28. Alright, and now 6 goes into 7, or 6 goes into 42 7 times. So 7 times 11 is 77. Make sure that you guys have your calculators out ready. So just to make it easier for you here guys, I'm just going to use our calculator. That's going to be 66 plus 28 minus 77. And that's going to give me a total here of 17 over 42. All right. Now, the answer that I have here is um, reduced already to its lowest term, and it is a proper fraction. So that is my final answer here, 17 over 42. All right. So pretty good so far, guys. Let's go on to question 1A, part 2. Now, we're required here, let's do a little zoom. We're required here to write the value of the cube root of 27 divided by 9 squared as a fraction in its lowest term. So how do we go about doing that now? Now, we can use our calculator if you have, I'm not sure what kind of calculator you're using, but most calculators will allow you to do the root of any number, all right? So I'm going to show you two ways in which you can do this. You can do it via your calculator or you can do it simply by hand. So let's try the calculator first. What I'll do here is that I'll press um, the number three, then I'll press second function and I'll press the root sign. All right, so that should give me the cube root of 27. Then I press 27. Well, my calculator is not giving me that. Now, there should be a button on your calculator that says um, X cube, maybe, or something of that sort. So I'm checking to see if I can find my calculator here that tells me um, to raise a number to the power of 3. I'm not seeing on my calculator the cube root symbol. Most calculators have it, so if you do, you can press the second function and press the cube root symbol or the cube symbol that says x cube. All right, now, since I don't have it on my calculator, I'm gonna to have to do it by hand. But um, since I already know what the answer is, I know that the cube root of 27 is literally asking me what number can I multiply by itself three times to give me 27. And I know that um, from knowing my cube table that 1 times 1 times 1 is 1, 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, and I also know that 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. So I know right off the bat that the cube root of 27 is equal to 3. I know that. All right? And um, 9 squared is 81. Okay, 9 squared is 81. So, 3 is a divisible factor into 81. So, when I reduce that there, what I'm going to get is 1 over 27. Alright, and that's my final answer. Now, 
I have to stress the fact that a lot of students may not necessarily know what the exact cube root of a particular number is. All right. So in this case, we're using 27, but this could be any number. All right. So if we want to do what this is now, here's what we can do. We can say that 27, we can say that the cube root of 27 is 27 raised to the power of one third. All right, because whenever you find the root of a particular number, it is always the number raised to one over the root of that number that you're trying to find. All right, so that's just a rule. That's the laws of indices that says that a raised to the power of one over n is equal to the nth root of a to the one. So that's a indices law that you should be familiar with if not um well get familiar with it all right so 27 raised to the one third all right now 27 can be expressed as three cubes once again i guess i suppose i guess you're gonna have to still know that 27 is three cubes all right so that's you could convert that 27 there to three cubes and then just multiply it by the power that you had there and that works out the same result as being equal to three and then nine squared is just pretty much what you see there all right that's just pretty much what you see there 81 and when you reduce that you're going to get one over 27 so you can do it by hand you could do it by a calculator it all depends on your skill level. All right. So hope you guys got that. Let's move on next to question 1B. Now, the thickness of one sheet of cardboard is given as 485 multiplied by 10 raised to the minus 2 millimeter. Now, a construction worker uses 75 sheets of cardboard stacked together to ins insulate a wall. You are to show that the exact thickness of the insulation is 363.75 millimeters. All right. So how do we go about doing this? Now, what we know is that we know the thickness of one sheet and we know how many sheets we are using. So this is a basic multiplication question. But by looking at this, I realize that there is about two different ways that you can get your answer. And I'm going to show you both ways, guys. All right. So here's method number one. We could simply say 75 multiplied by 485 times 10 to the minus 2. Now, a little knowledge is needed here to understand that whenever a number is written in its standard form notation, you can convert that standard form notation back to its decimal form. Now, if you have 10 to the minus 2, what this literally means is that this is 75 multiplied by 485 multiplied by 1 over 10 squared all right again this is the law of indices that says that if you have a particular base raised to a negative power then you can reciprocate this quantity that is raised to a negative power and change the power from negative to positive so this is one way of looking at it all right now we know that um 70, we know that 75 multiplied by 485, we know that 10 squared is 100. So this is literally telling me that I need to divide 485 by 100. Now, if I divide 485 by 100, and I'm going to do everything one time due to the lack of space. So 485 divided by 100, that's going to give me 4.85. All right, please confirm that. Then I'm going to simply just multiply the same answer here by 75. And what that turns out to be is exactly what they want for the answer. 
0.75. So that's one way of getting your answer, all right? And that is if you know the law of indices. Um, you could have gotten this 485 or you could have gotten the result of 485 divided by 100 simply by understanding that, let's say you have 485 as we have here times 10 to the minus 2. You could, you could see that 10 to the minus 2 is just dividing the 485 by 100 just going back two places. So you see there, when you go back two places, what you're going to end up with is 4.85, all right? And then it just times that by 75 and that will give you your result of 363.75. So that's one way of doing it. That's another way of doing it. That is if you know that negative means to go backwards however many spaces and positive means to go forward however many spaces. All right. So that's two ways of doing it. And then finally, um, we could express the 75 Again, in standard form, so 75, as it is there, would have been 75 multiplied by 10 to the power of 0, simply because it didn't, it wasn't raised to a particular power, so we assume that the power is 0. And then we're going to simply put this in a bracket here, and then we can also multiply by that number that is 485 times 10 squared, 10 to the minus 2, I'm sorry. Now, when this is just basically using the standard form multiplication method, all right? So we could say 75 times 485. So 75 multiplied by 485. And that should give me an answer of 300 and, well, not 363, 36,375. And then what we're going to do now is simply, um, we're simply going to just add the powers simply because 10 to the 0, multiplied by 10 to the minus 2 is going to become 10 to the 0 plus minus 2. All right? Very complicated way of doing it, but it's very good that you understand different methods. Yes? So this is going to become 36,375 multiplied by when we add the powers, we're still going to end up with 10 to the minus 2. And then now, again, the knowledge of understanding that 10 to the minus 2 is just basically 1 over 10 squared. Or you could just simply go back two places here. And you're going to see that you end up with the same answer of 363.75. All right. So three different ways of working out the same question to get that one mark. I just wanted to show you all those different ways. This is the reason why I'm working through the past paper at this space. The idea of working the past paper is not necessarily to give you the answer one way but it's to show you different ways of thinking as i said in the beginning all right so hope you guys got that we're going to move on next to question 1b part 2. now it says here write the thickness of the installation to two significant figures so what this means here is that we already have the thickness which we had calculated earlier to be 363 Point seven five, and so correct the two significant figures our first significant value here is 3 our second significant value here is 6 so we just draw a line right between the 6 and the 3 and we would check the digit that comes after so that number is 3 now since 3 is less than 5 we can simply ignore all the digits that comes after. And so our final answer is going to be 36 along with a place folder. Now, a lot of persons will ask, what is this 0 for? This is just to ensure that the fitness that is calculated correct to two significant figures is near to the original or the exact value of what we had initially calculated. Now, had you not put a zero here, you would have simply be telling um, the marker that the installation fitness has been reduced. And so that would not be possible because when you are approximating a certain value, the result should be pretty much very close to the original value. So that is why this zero here um, is 
very much important to get in that one mark all right so hopefully that was good now we are also correct to one decimal place that number so again the number is 363.75 our first decimal place here is seven so once again we just draw a, a line here and that's just how i do it i'll check the digit that comes after that's five and the rules for approximation is that if a number is or if the digit if the nth plus one digit is greater than or equal to five we just simply add one to the digit before so it's going to be 363 point adding one to seven we're going to get eight and we're going to ignore whatever digits that comes after the required decimal place all right and that's just pretty much how that is done all right so hope you guys got that we're gonna move on to getting this number here in standard form so what we have here is 363.75 and to be reminded that a, a number written in standard form is in the form a times 10 raised to the power of n where n is an integer which literally means a negative or a positive whole number and a is a number that should be greater than or equal to 1 but at the same time it should be less than 10 so the maximum value that a can be is 9.99 and the lowest number that it can be is 1 so that's what it means yes now we need our our number at the moment here our a value here at the moment is 363 now if we go to the right the number is getting bigger but what we actually need is the number to become smaller so in this case we're going to have to go to the left now let's see what happens if we go to the left one space the number now becomes 36 point so forth so we need to go another place to the left and the number is now 3.6375 now when you look at that number you can see clearly that it is greater than 1 and at the same time it is less than 10 so it satisfies the requirement for what a should be so our a value here is 3.6375 it is always times 10 and this will be raised to the power of n now what is n how do we get the value of n n represents the number of places that you had moved either to the left or to the right now standard form does the opposite of what the number line tells us we know that the number line zero is in the middle and on the left we find negative numbers and on the right we find positive numbers the standard form does the opposite all right so naturally if we go to the left our brains will be telling us that hey we move two places to the left so it is negative two but because it's the opposite of the number line we know the answer is going to be positive two all right and that's going to be the result written in standard form now another way that you could do this is just simply a lot of teachers will tell you that you need to move the point behind the first non-zero digit well that is also good that's i use that technique sometimes to tell students to move the point behind the first non-zero digit so telling them that you'd still end up with the decimal point being behind the three all right this is in front this is behind the point is behind the three but this is in front of the six all right very basic english language sometimes gives students problems in getting the answer but there we have it guys 3.6375 times 10 to the 2. moving on to question 1c all right we were at part 1b c so now we're at part 1c marco is on vacation in the caribbean he charges he changes 4,500 Mexican pesos to Eastern Caribbean dollars. He receives 630 Eastern Caribbean dollars. You have to complete a statement below about the exchange rate. So this particular question is asking us for the rate. Usually what they do is they ask us to do the 
amount of money that you receive from a particular exchange rate what they're doing the opposite here no problem so let's write down what we know we know that he had 4,500 Mexican pesos and we know that when he changed he got 630 Eastern Caribbean dollars we are searching for what is the value of one Eastern Caribbean dollars right so therefore the Mexican peso is more than the Eastern Caribbean so okay so this is a small currency pretty much all right and when we're converting from small to a bigger currency we divide that's just the formula that I teach my students so I'm gonna have 4,500 divided by 630 and that will tell me the value of one Eastern Caribbean dollars all right when you're going to work out later you're going to get an answer of 7.14 eastern sorry sorry yes eastern caribbean dollars so one so one eastern caribbean dollars i'm sorry so one eastern caribbean dollar is equal to 7.14 mexican peso all right so if you want to verify your answer, if this is correct, then if we have 630 Mexican peso and you multiply that by 7.14, it should give you 4,000, near $4,500 in Mexican peso. Okay? So that's it for that question, guys. Now, let's move on to question two here that is asking us to factorize the following expressions completely. And so, the expression given here is 12n square minus 4mn. Now before we get into this, let's discuss, let's just talk a little bit or let me reminded about the different types of factorization techniques that are out there. Now the famous one is of course the quadratic, where we use the EC method. We have the grouping technique. We have the difference of two squares, difference of two squares dots and we also have the 8cf method and what i like to do when i'm teaching this or when i'm doing a pass paper like what i'm doing now i like to do what is called the elimination method i cross out what the expression cannot be and why it can't be that particular method now i'm going to cross off the quadratic simply because the quadratic usually has three terms Alright, it has a square term, a term that has um, the variable, and it also can look like this also, but it also has a constant here. Now, this is kind of like a quadratic because we could say that the constant here is zero, if we wanted to. Alright, so we could do the whole EC method, but it's just one mark, so I'm thinking that it's a lot more simpler than that. So I'm thinking that maybe, let's see here. I'm thinking that maybe this is not a quadratic. I don't think that they want us to use a quadratic technique for just one mark. So the mere fact that it doesn't have an immediate constant or a visible constant, it means that I don't think it's a quadratic. I also don't think that it's grouping simply for the main reason that quadrat um, grouping technique always has four terms. This only has two terms. So it can't be that. It sort of looks like a difference of two squares, but again, it isn't. Why? Number one, it looks like a difference of two squares simply because of the minus sign here and perhaps this 4 that could be expressed as a power of 2 squared, or expressed as 2 squared. But with the difference of two squares, both the terms and the numbers are perfect square values. So since 4 is a perfect square but 12 isn't, that gives me the idea that it is not a difference of two squares. So that leaves me only with the option of the 8CF method. Now with the 8CF method, guys, we're just looking for a number or a term or a combination of a number and a term that is exactly divisible into both terms that make up the expression. So in this case here, we realize that there is a divisible factor of between 4 and 12, and that is 4. And there's also a divisible factor between n squared and mn, 
and that is going to be n. Please note that when you're finding the HCF, do not use the variable with the highest power, simply because it says HCF. But you're looking for the variable with the lowest power. Alright? So that's why we're using the n and not the n square. Now, 12 divided by 4, 12 divided by 4 is going to give us 3. And n squared divided by n, if you just write it down here, n squared divided by n, that's going to be n times n divided by n. So these two n cancels out, leave us with n here. So that's n here. You could do it that way if you want to, as a little side notation. We will get any extra marks for it though. You can just simply understand that n squared divided by n is just n. Just something that you have to know. And then what we do here next is, we say 4 divided into 4 is 1. You could write the 1 if you want to. Let's just write it for now. And n into n go again goes 1 times, so the 1 is already there. And there's nothing to divide the m, so it's just m that's left. Alright? Now, we don't usually write 1m. If we realize that the division le leaves us with a coefficient of 1, we don't usually write it. Alright? So we just simply, if it was a 2, we'd have to write it. It's just a 1, so we just leave it right there as just m. Alright? And that's your factorization. Pretty good. Like I said, guys, when I'm working these questions, the idea is not necessarily to just give you the answer. I could just look at it and just tell you that, okay, the answer is 4n open bracket 3 and minus m. But the whole idea is that when I'm doing these, I want to show you um, what your mind thinks of and why it can't be. This is how you can do these kind of questions when you see it on the exam, all right? If you're currently doing the exam in whatever year. Right, we're currently in year 2021, so you could be watching this video in 2023 or 2022, and um, maybe this technique could be of assistance to you, okay? Alright, so we're going to go on to the next question here. So, we have to show that x divided by 1 minus x minus 4x is equal to this expression over here, which is x open bracket 4x minus 3 divided by 1 minus x. Now at first glance, you're probably looking at this and you're probably seeing this is a difficult question. And from my experience, um, I can tell you that this happened to me when I was learning math. However, um, once you have the fundamental principle of how to work a fractional expression, then you have no need to worry. You just have to take it step at a time. So let's do that. One step at a time. We know what the result is because they are telling us that we should show that 1 divided by 1 minus x minus 4x is equal to this. So they, we already know that this is the answer. We just have to show how we would get there. Alright, so the first thing, let's do a little rewrite here. We're going to do x divided by 1 minus x minus and so this 4x is just out there. Right, we have this term as an algebraic fraction. We have an algebraic term here, but it doesn't look like a fraction. However, all numbers, all expressions can be expressed as a fraction simply because it is under the rational number theory. All right? So when a number or a variable doesn't have an visible denominator we know that the denominator is understood as mean one all right so we know that we are trying to work it out to get this so we're going to go about that process now it's an algebraic fraction so let's find the lcm all right now one of the problems that you might face in a question like this is finding the lcm so is the lcm one is the LCM x? Is it negative x? What exactly is the LCM? A lot of persons will be accustomed to LCM being a numerical value or maybe something simply like 5x or 4x or, you know, something very simple. But this expression here, all right, I'm going to tell you what the name of this expression is. It's called a binomial expression. And it's called a binomial expression simply because we have two terms that are merged together, but yet they are considered to be one thing. So 1 minus x, we're not looking at it 
as if it's just one and this is minus x it's one thing it's like saying 10 or 5 it's just that it's split up into two pieces right, so for example we had like the number 10 10 could be written as two different binomial um ex it could be expressed in a binomial form so we can say that this is 9 minus 1 or we could say this is 8 minus 2 all right so what you're seeing here 1 minus x is just kind of like this here it's just expressing the actual value in two different terms where one is a variable and one is a numerical value so i hope you guys got that understanding so the lcm here usually whenever we have a binomial expression we use the binomial expression we use the binomial expression and merge it with whatever value is over here now this value here could be a two so we'll just write the two here it could be 5x we could just write the 5x here whatever it is the binomial expression will be combined with whatever is here to form the lcm all right now the mere fact that this is a one we don't necessarily have to put the one there because it is an understood coefficient all right it's understood now the reason why i'm going to put the one is simply because there's going to be a mistake that is very very common among csec students all right and we can avoid this mistake simply by putting the one right here especially when it's a one all right let's highlight that arrow that always pops up now the first thing here is that we're going to be asking ourselves is what is one minus x divided into this thing here let's go to the side all right because i could just tell you the answer is going to be one but why let's say we have one open bracket one minus x and we're dividing it by one minus x then what's going to happen is that this will cancel this so we know that the result here is one so one times x all right so we'll just multiply it by the top now we're going to write down this minus sign here all right and then now let's just erase here what is one into one times one minus x squared now i want to highlight something here for you had this not been here all right had that one not been there you'd have done you'd have said that um one minus x divided by one and what a lot of students will do and this is a fundamental error right they will just cross out the one here and say that the answer is minus x and they will just write the minus x here and then different things can happen after that right here just the moment that you did this made the whole entire question incorrect right and you can comment you can leave a comment in the sec in the comment section below and let me know if it is that that's exactly what you would have done if you're doing the right thing which i'm about to show you you're doing well and you have everything cut down right you have to be honest with yourself is this what i would have done okay i know not to do it all right so you have to be very honest with yourself or else you will not develop as a student so what is the correct procedure the correct procedure is to ensure that that one is there all right and so we're going to say one open bracket one minus x divides by one now we can see that this one cancels this one why am i able to cancel this one with this one and why am i not able to cancel this one with this one why is it different okay for this here if you're going to divide the one into the one minus x because this is one term this is one minus x is not a single term so you can't just take out a part of the term and divide it by the denominator all right you have to divide you can do that but you're gonna have to divide both terms by one so you would have actually end up with one into one goes one time and one into x goes x times so that's what you would have gotten basically one minus x which is natural one divided into anything gives you the same thing all right so you're not able to cancel the one just into a part of the term you have to cancel both all right so that's illegal or that's mathematically illegal 
So what am I able to do it over here? Isn't it kind of like the same thing? Well, kind of like the same thing in fact that this is two different terms. One minus x is a term by itself and one is a term by itself and we all know that we can cancel when we are multiplying which is naturally the way how we do fractions once we're multiplying we find terms that can be cancelled so you cannot cancel across a subtraction sign or an addition sign but you can cancel across a multiplication sign because this is saying one multiplied by one minus x divided by one so that is why you can cancel the two ones here all right so hopefully that information was very useful to you there or it's just something that you have to just pretty much know in your head all right so there we have it so we have one open bracket one minus x divided by 1, these two 1 cancel, so that is why we know our answer here is 1 minus x. Now here's a mistake that usually happens here guys. When we say this now, we're going to say, you see this 4x here, we're going to write it down right here, and we're going to open the bracket, and we're going to have the result of the division. Alright, so that's what we're going to have there. Is that pretty good? Now, we're going to have now, we're going to distribute here, Alright, because what a lot of persons will do, like I said, the mistake is that they will say minus open bracket 1 minus x and leave the 4x on the outside, which kind of makes the distribution a little bit more complicated. Let's say we have this here, 1 minus x times 4x here. It makes it a little bit more difficult, you know, Lo it just looks a bit different, it looks like it's a different technique that we have to use, so just trying to keep things simple here. Right. Now, if there is just a two more question, guys, I am taking my time to go through the different steps and process and the thought, the things that go through your mind, so we can eliminate what's best, we can eliminate what's not good, and keep what's best, what thought process is best. All right. So don't mind the length of the question. One times x is simply x. I'm going to have negative 4x times 1 is negative 4x there. And negative 4x times negative x, that's going to give us positive 4x squared. And that's going to be divided by 1 open bracket 1 minus x. At this stage now, you can remove the 1 because it's no longer needed. We needed it earlier so as to make the division process easier to get the correct answer. But if you want to remove the 1, you can leave it there. You can keep it if you want to remove it, you can. We have two terms that are alike here, the x and the minus 4x. So if we subtract these two like terms here, we're going to have negative 3x. And we're going to have positive 4x squared. And then it's all over. At this stage, I'm just going to remove it. Alright, because I'm keeping my mind on what they want me to have. I could have put the one here if I wanted to. No problem. At the top, we need a specific formation. So we need to factorize what is at the top. The common factor here is going to be... X is common. Alright, when I take out x, when I divide 3x by x, I'm going to have negative 3. I could write it here if I want, but because I want this formation, I'm just going to write it at the end here. And x divides into 4x squared, 4x squared, divided by x. That's going to give me 4x. And everything now is all over 1 minus x. You can put the 1 here if you want to. And there we have it. That's our answer. Our answer has been shown right here. Alright, so I think that there was a lot of stuff that came out of that in terms of um, these kind of questions. Um, it's just two marks. If it was just the answer, I could have gotten this in less than a minute. But then I wanted to show you what and what can happen if you make certain fundamental errors, okay? All right, so we're going to move on to the next question. We are to hence solve the equation x divided by 1 minus x minus 4x equals 0. 
all right now with experience guys and with a lot of practice you guys may be also able to you may be able to pick up like me that this may come out to be some something like a quadratic equation let's see what happens though it looks like it's going to come out to me that well let's see now um let's do another rewrite here so this is just one all right that's not one obviously that's going to be x divided into one minus x minus 4x equals zero so we're just going to multiply let's just write the rules here multiply sides by the denominator which is 1 minus x so if i multiply both sides by 1 minus x what i mean is that i'm going to multiply each term on both sides of the equal sign by 1 minus x so i'm going to write it very small i'm going to have 1 minus x multiplied by the x over 1 minus x and here's where a lot of mistake happens student forgets to multiply the 4x also by 1 minus x all right they just simply just multiply the 1 minus x only once each term on both sides of the equation must be multiplied by 1 minus x and that's going to be equal to well if you want to write it down 0 multiplied by right, 0 multiplied by 1 minus x we know literally 0 multiplied by anything is 0 so i'm not gonna go through all of that so it's just going to be 0 all right all right so by simplification now we're going to have um this will cancel this so we're going to be left with x minus we're going to distribute here minus 4x times 1 is minus 4x and minus 4x times minus 4x is positive 4x squared yes let's check it negative times negative is positive 4x times x is 4x squared and that's equal to zero all right so we don't end up with a complete quadratic equation but it's looking like a quadratic we just don't have a constant well we have a constant but it's just zero all right so i need some space here guys so i'm just going to just erase here and erase here so what we have now guys is just simply 4x squared let's write let's rewrite it in the original form 4x squared and there's two like terms here so x minus 4x is just minus 3x and that's equal to zero all right all right so we can do some sort of factorization here guys again we can use the we could use the um ac method but that's going to be very long we can just use the eight safe method here so the common factor here on both sides is x and what is left in the bracket is just simply 4x so 4x squared divided by x is just 4x and 3x divided by x is minus 3 and that's equal to zero all right so we have a product of two factors being equal to zero that simply tells me that both factors will be equal to zero make sure that you guys have that that i just erased all right so i have 4x minus 3 is equal to zero and i have x is equal to zero i already have one solution here so i'm just going to solve this one here 4x is equal to positive 3 i added 3 to both sides and if i divide both sides by 4 I'm going to get x is equal to 3 over 4, 3 quarter. All right? So that's how you got get that answer. All right? So hopefully you guys are following me so far. A nice paper. Lots of knowledge here. Lots of experience. This is good preparation for your exam, guys. Let's move on to question 2C. We are to make V the subject of the formula. And the formula given to us here, let's do a rewrite so it's clear. P is equal to the square root of 5 plus VT. So, what do we do here to make V the subject? A very common mistake when students are lacking in knowledge or lacking in practice they may do some sort of mathematical illegal operation by just taking the v out 
and putting it where the P is and putting the P where the V is and then you know just calling it a day and that's not what we want from you guys what we want here is to see you apply the necessary mathematical methods to get to the answer now for me the way how I see this and the way I explain this to my students is that this square root sign or you could let's just call it a root sign in this case a square root but it could be a cube root or fourth root the way how i explain this is that this is acting like an umbrella so it's preventing us access to the subject that we want which is going to be v so it's acting like an umbrella so we need to remove that umbrella in order to legally get access to the v and to remove in this case this square root we're going to simply have to square both sides square both sides of the equation or the formula so by squaring both sides if we square the p we're going to get p squared but let's just write this down here we're going to square over here i'm just going to just use a different color ink for you guys here and show you what's going to happen if i square over here the square root will be cancelled by the square Right, so I'm just making a note of that right here because I don't want to do too much lengthy working out. All right, so once we square both sides, the p is now p squared, but because the square root is cancelled by the power of two, we are only left with what is underneath the root. All right, all right, we're almost there. We're adding five to vt. So we need to subtract 5 from both sides, so we should end up with p squared minus 5 is equal to vt, alright, so we just subtracted 5 from both sides. Lot of teachers will tell you that you have to carry over the 5, alright, from a layman's perspective that is also correct, but the reality is that we subtracted 5 from both sides. And since that V is the required subject we, and V is being multiplied by T, we're simply going to need to divide both sides by T. So that this T cancels this T, so our final answer is that V is equal to P squared minus 5 over T. And that's our final answer, guys. Okay? that is how you get it now these statements here you don't have to write them this is the purpose of me teaching you um from a past paper all right so we're now going to get into part d here the distance needed to stop a car d varies directly as the square of the speed s at which it is traveling a car traveling at a speed of 70 kilometers per hour require a distance of 40 meters to make a stop what is the distance required to stop the car traveling at 80 kilometers per hour so this is a variation question and with a variation question guys you need to know the different types of variation the direct variation formula and the inverse variation or the indirect variation formula so what we can do here guys is simply um, identify what type of variation this is and this is saying that it is that d varies directly as the square the square of the speed s so the general formation for um, for a direct variation we normally use y and x so we say that the formula is y is equal to kx that's the general form when, when y varies directly as x. But there's some alteration to the formula here. Number one, we have changed the letters or the variables being used. And also there's an adjustment to the variable x. So the first thing that they said here is that d varies directly as the square of the speed s. So d would be acting as the y and s would be acting as the s. And then they're also saying that the, s the speed must be squared so right away i know that the adjusted formula is going to be that d varies directly as the square of x remember that k is a constant of variation so that k is always going to be there 
all right i'm going to change this variation formula here to this variation symbol here to an equal sign because we need an equation all right so this is the formula that i'm working with here d is equal to k x squared now it says at which speed it's traveling now a car is traveling at a speed of 70 so right away we know that x is 70 requires a distance of 40 meters so right away we know that d is equal to 40 all right off the bat what we don't know is that we don't know what's the constant of variation so we're going to need to find the value of k because we can't find anything else without we know the constant of variation what's causing the variation to take place so right away i'm going to say all right d is 40 so 40 is equal to k we don't know and that's going to be multiplied and that's going to be multiplied by 70 squared so 40 is equal to k and 70 squared i believe that's 4900 let's check it again 70 squared that's correct 4900 that's 4900 and if we divide both sides by 4900 we're going to get k is equal to 40 divided by 4900 you can cancel it down zero cancel zero here and we could use two so we could say two into four goes two times and two into 490 was 245 times so I guess the constant of variation here is 2 divided by 245 we could turn it into a decimal if you want to but I think that the fraction is more acceptable all right so that's the constant of variation now a lot of person will be um, probably looking at the question and saying sir at no point did I see that they asked me to find the k but k is a requirement to do the constant of variation so it could be a case where they told you that the value of k is so and so or they might not told you the point is you must have it so if you're given if you're given the constant of variation it makes the math a lot easier depending on the question or if it's not given you're going to have to find it all right so let's continue so the car is traveling at a speed of 70 which we, do, we have already established and it requires a distance of 40 to make a stop now what they want now considering that we now have the constant of variation they want to know what is the distance and in this case remember that distance is being represented by d so what is the distance required to stop a car traveling at a speed of 80 so we know that in this example here x is equal to 80 but we don't know what d is equal to and we know that k is equal to 2 divided by 245 so using the formula that d is equal to kx squared we know that we don't know d but we know that k is 2 divided by 245 and that's going to be multiplied by the distance squared sorry that's going to be equal to the the speed squared because x is the speed how do we know that d is a distance and x is a speed okay so it's not x it's actually s all right so let's just make some adjustment here i thought they were using x all right so this is just going to be a very basic adjustment here it's going to be d it's going to be k s squared all right it's going to be s here all right so speed is s right and so this is going to be adjusted also to be s squared all right good that's an adjustment with the letters being used so 80 squared that's going to be equal to 6400 so we're looking at two need some space here guys so that's going to be so d is going to be equal to two divided by 245 multiplied by 6400 
we could just do everything on the calculator at one time. So 2 divided by 245 multiplied by 6400. And we get a distance of 52.24. Is it meters? It's kilometers. Alright? And that's it. That's how you work out uh, variation questions of that nature. All right, all right, pretty good, pretty good. So let's just double check sometimes when you do your math. Let's double check to see if everything is okay. We've used all the values. What is the distance required to stop a car traveling at a speed of 80 kilometers per hour? All right, so that's it for that question, guys. We're going to pick up on question three in the next video. All right. Do take care, guys.